the latest and greatest on Gophers prospects who have not yet committed, but could be an option for the Gophers, including Jackson Howard, whose announcement is this Friday. What does John Garcia, the head of Sports Illustrated's director of football recruiting, think? We're going to talk about it today. I don't know if you're going to like it, but it's something you need to hear. Locked on Golden Gophers, your daily podcast on the Minnesota Golden Gophers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You're listening to Locked On Golden Gophers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today, I am joined by special guest, Sports Illustrated insider for the Locked On Podcast Network, John Garcia. And we are going to be talking Gophers recruits, potential guys that we could still get committed here, what are the realistic odds of it, and what maybe isn't so realistic, and other questions that come up along the way. I think you're going to enjoy this one, but wait no further. Let's jump in and get to it with John Garcia. All right, Gophers fans, I mentioned him, but we have the Director of Football Recruiting with Sports Illustrated and our very own insider with the Lockdown Podcast Network, John Garcia Jr., here with us today to talk some Gophers recruits. Thank you for joining us, John. Yeah, happy to be here. Uh, You can't really talk recruiting or Big Ten ball without P.J. Fleck and the guys. So, yeah, Minnesota's been hot, so let's talk about it. Absolutely. And I'm going to we're just going to dive right in because I know that Gophers fans, you know, we we've had a really big early June with our recruiting and whatnot. And people are anxious, John. I'm I'm, I'm going to level with you. You know, we see that 13th recruiting ranking and people are like, is it too good to be true? Are we going to get hurt? So let's talk about some of the guys that we're waiting on here and that maybe could have potential and maybe you'll bring to light if we should tame our expectations or not with some of these guys. So I know two of the guys I want to dive in right away was Ethan Cole and Elanius Davis. Uh, Both seem to have some Midwest uh, interest, but Elanius Davis also had an OV with Washington. So what are you hearing with all these guys? Yeah, well, look, Elanius is an in-state kid, right? Moorhead High School, uh, a guy that, you know, you just kind of say, hey, Minnesota is going to stay in this race as long as they want. And they certainly uh, have done that. Uh, it looks like, like you said, uh, kind of a, a widespread battle of Midwest schools. I think Iowa State is, is one to keep an eye on. We'll see about this Washington official visit. I think that's something to note. I do think that the Huskies, although they're in a new coaching staff, defensively, they're going to recruit a little bit better right out of the gate. You know, that's where they've been a little bit more productive in terms of development and any NFL success. So when it's a defensive prospect, you keep a little bit closer tabs on the Washington Huskies. But look, as we said, this is a defensive lineman who's in state as extremely familiar uh, with the Gophers, still took an official visit uh, up that way, uh, I believe to two weeks ago, uh, to really kick off uh, the the later stages of his recruitment. And I think that created a bit of a lead uh, for the Gophers. It looks like uh, the the Iowa State trip did its part as well. So I really look at this as as a bit of a two horse race, um, but you can't sleep on on the last school to get the visit uh, with, with the Washington Huskies. But I do think at the end of the day, this could be kind of the last big in-state recruit because it's going so well uh, with with the local talent. I think when you, from a national perspective, when you think of Minnesota, you think of a couple in-state targets they could jump on every year, but really they're going to have to go spread throughout the Big Ten footprint, dip into Florida, maybe hit the West Coast to build a balanced class. But this year, they've proven that theory wrong. I think seven verbal commitments already within state lines. Uh, so why not throw another one in there? And I think Davis uh, feels like a, a pretty solid bet uh, at this point. Um, and then uh, with Alenius, I, I do think, you know, the, the defensive line group is, is expanding. You know, I think there's still some other targets out there, uh, but, you know, you got to hit home first. So I do think that not only, you know, he jumps on board relatively soon, but I do think that Minnesota is in, in a great spot to land this verbal commitment, especially if it comes soon. If he if he changes his tone a little bit, I would I would maybe back off of that. If he goes into the fall, maybe you think that Washington or some of these other schools can gain some more traction and vault uh, Minnesota as the top school. But if he sticks with a preseason commitment plan, you got to feel good about the Gophers' chances. 
Love to hear it. All right, I'm going to throw out two more. Uh, so I've got six prospects to kind of tackle. I'm going to throw out two more and just what are the things you're hearing about them and the latest and greatest. And those two guys are Philip Daniels, offensive lineman, and then Cameron Fleming, cornerback. Yeah, I'll start with Fleming really quickly. You know, a kid who's really got a, a regional recruiting feel, right? He's a Virginia kid, uh, certainly Virginia, Virginia Tech, North Carolina. Those schools are involved. And then Minnesota's like the outlier in this recruitment uh, from a geographical perspective. And, and that usually means two things. One, it's a bit of an uphill battle for that outlying school. But two, the fact that you're in this race, uh, I think says a lot about how recruits uh, view the Gophers overall. You know, I think even five years ago, this would be just a Virginia Tech, North Carolina kind of deal. And Minnesota would have already been on the cutting room floor. So staying in the race this late for a coveted corner type in the middle of ACC country, I think says a lot about uh, the trajectory of this program. I think it's, it gets easy to, to dive into kind of the, the tangible, right? Did you get them or did you not? Recruiting's right. cutthroat, so you have to measure it that way. I do think that's true to a degree, but when you really peel the onion, you, you look at the trends and, and the footprint and where it can expand and being in the race this late, for prospects like this, I do think says a lot about the future of the program, but, but it is a bit of an uphill battle here for Fleming. I don't want to, I guess, sugarcoat it too much. It <laughs> looks like he's more likely to, to stay in that ACC footprint, but look, there's, there's been some good traction. He's taken visits. Um, so you're still in it in, until you're not, uh, as they say. So TBD on, on, on Fleming, but it does look like he's going to stay a little bit closer to, to his um, hometown, home state, uh, regional footprint, uh, at least. And then with Daniels, kind of a different situation, right? Uh, Cincinnati kid, one who would really be the final piece of a, a really strong offensive line class, uh, already four verbal commitments at the position. So I think when, when you're kind of building at a specific position like this, it gets a little bit easier on the trail because there's, there's a finite amount of spots. And then the other kids start recruiting as well, right? The other mm -hmm. O-line commits are like, hey, Philip, come be the last piece of this puzzle. Uh, Minnesota got uh, one of the officials here recently as well. It looks like BC and Pitt, another group of ACC schools are, are amid this battle here. Um, but look, I, I do think Minnesota is in a nice spot. I wouldn't call them the outright favorites going into it, but he does look like he's going to make a commitment here very soon. So I would, between Daniels and Fleming, I'd keep a closer eye on Daniels relative to jumping into this Minnesota class of, of 2023, uh, even though it looks like both kids could come off the board here pretty soon. All right. I mean, you love to hear it and we'll definitely hone in on keeping an eye on Philip Daniels for sure over here at the Lockdown Golden Gophers. Now I've got two names, the final two names I'm going to ask you about specifically that I know Gophers fans are holding their breath about, but we'll, I want you to lay it to us straight. I want to, I want to hear it. Uh, don't pull any punches or, you know, help the Gophers fans with their hopes, but that's Marjavius Moss and Jackson Howard, both four-star guys. What are you hearing? Look, the state of Louisiana is going to factor into both of these guys here. Moss, of course, is from uh, Shreveport. You know, he's a kid that it looked like. So he takes the official uh, mid-June, uh, really loves everything about Minnesota. And then there's like a pause. Uh, and, and I think that's where you, like you said, to say it straight up. When there's a pause there and the plans start to change, the commitment timeline starts to shift, I do think that um, there's a reason for that. Uh, so it could could project down the road, like Minnesota was in pretty early with this kid, um, Baylor's involved. Other schools have been offering here recently. I think he just got mm -hmm. like Oklahoma State the other day. So he's yep. still maybe at the emerging point of his recruitment where it could start to extend and maybe bleed into the fall. Now, most of these kids wanna be committed sooner rather than later. But if you keep picking up offers, all of a sudden you're going to think at least about extending the process. So I do think that could be a cause for concern for Minnesota fans uh, because it looked like after the visit that the Gophers were in a really great spot and they may still be there today, but to me, it's a matter of who else jumps into this race and or pushes for Marjavius that makes it a little bit more interesting and potentially longstanding before he makes a verbal commitment. But if I'm reading this thing way off and he's actually much closer to making a decision, 
the perception flips and, and you feel really good about the Gophers chances. I believe that's the only official visit uh, that Moss has taken to date. So that is typically a really strong signal uh, for, for the leader in, in a recruiting process. So timeline, the big factor with Moss, uh, it's the opposite with Jackson Howard. We know uh, it's coming down the pike. July 1st is, is the commitment date. There's a final four that's all over the place, like an unconventional final four, Minnesota, Michigan, LSU, Miami, Miami gets him on campus this weekend, LSU just hosted him. And there is growing confidence in Baton Rouge uh, to bring in Jackson Howard. And that's why I said Louisiana is going to factor into both of these recruits that we wrap up with. Um, fascinating kid, best player in the state, could be a legitimate power five tight end or defensive end. You guys, I'm sure, have talked about it at length uh, in terms of his athletic profile, but it creates such a different dynamic uh, during the recruiting process because not only is it, hey, these schools like me, when you start to link positions towards schools, it, it really starts to shift your recruiting perception. Um, and I think a lot of these programs are like Minnesota in that, hey, we'll take Jackson Howard however we can get him. If he wants to play <laughs> offense or defense, come on down and we'll figure it out on the practice field. Um, I know Minnesota's in that boat. I do believe a couple of these others, Miami in particular, feels the same way. But again, LSU is starting to build a little bit of confidence here. Uh, Jamar Kane's done a really good job in that recruitment um, down there. Uh, I know Greg Harbaugh's done a really good job for Minnesota. The tight end position's been kind of light work, right? You know, there's already multiple guys brought in. So it's a matter of, uh, you know, can you, you put a, a really big icing on that cake? with Jackson Howard. Um, and I think there's a lot of misdirection here. You know, the Miami visit is still TBD. So we'll see how that goes. We know he's been there in the past, um, but I do think that plan has to be uh, laid out very clearly by Mario Cristobal and company uh, this weekend. I'm actually going to camp at Miami tomorrow. So if Jackson pops up, uh, I'll give you guys a ring and, and let you know how he's looking. I'm sure it'll be great. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'm curious to see how Miami closes with the last official visit but you know there's there's not a whole lot of predicting going on with Howard and that should be a good thing for Minnesota fans because there's no school to which he's more familiar whether it's the city the campus the culture the roster what uh, is expected uh, at Minnesota uh, and I think there was a time in this recruitment Kane where Jackson was was setting his official visits he had been, he's been in Minnesota like double digit times, right? There was a point where he probably wasn't going to take an official to Minnesota. And at that point, it was like, okay, it was a good run from the in-state program, but eventually, you know, he's just too national of a recruit to keep home. But then all of a sudden there was a change of, of his mind and his plan. And he takes the Minnesota official and he loves it when he gets that intimate visit on campus. And I think that's what propelled the Gophers into this final four. And that's what has a lot of intrigue around this kid. He's really tough to peg. And that could mean at this point, just a couple of days away from a commitment that he might not know. So again, if there's a lot of uncertainty for the hometown kid, the home state kid, that's a great situation for the local school or, and or the underdog in a recruitment. And in this case, Minnesota takes both of those posts in, in the Jackson Howard recruitment. So uncertainty and a lack of, hey, he's going here. That's a good thing for the Gophers, in my opinion, in, in trying to track this kid's commitment. So it'll be fascinating July 1st, but um, you know, I'm not counting out the Gophers just yet. For sure. And I think you bring up a really good point at that. Like any uncertainty could play to our favor seeing as you're worth what would be most familiar you have relationships with the guys that have already committed here you have your family that would be close so I think I I'm right there with you when you say if there is any uncertainty that could be in our benefit so love hearing that and I thank you for those insights but I got a few more questions for you now we know that it's early in the Gophers like I said we're 13th in the national rankings but what do you see as maybe a realistic finish reading the tea leaves? I know it could be a crapshoot and we could look back at this and be like, whoa, we were way off. But if you had to take a shot in the dark, what range do you think the Gophers could finish in seeing this early start? Well, with, with 18 verbal commitments and seemingly room to add five, six, seven more guys, it really looks like PJ Flex is going to take a full class. And normally it like, Five years ago and, and beyond that, I would never bring up 
volume when we're talking about the, the best classes, but because of the transfer portal, because of how crazy roster management has been for basically every single college football program, there's a lot of schools that aren't planning on even taking 20 verbal commitments. They want to stay in that 15 to 18 range, maybe, to leave some spots open. So I do think the, the plan for Minnesota, as it appears to be a, a pretty full class, that gives the, the class ranking a higher ceiling uh, because, you know, the more prospects you get, the better you feel about certain positions. Like we talked about the tight end position and offensive line being big strengths of this class so far, you start to get a more highly subjective uh, opinion of a program when they start to put units together, at least in how we do it at Sports Illustrated. We don't use like an algorithm or a formula to, to rank these classes. We're humans, they're humans. We're going to rank them subjectively because of that, because that's the game, right? So right. Uh, we rank recruits that way. So why would we do anything different when it comes to the class ranking? And again, and how we look at it, quarterback is important. Positional units are important relative to the need. So if you have more room for volume, you get a better chance of, of being a little bit higher there on the list. It doesn't mean you should just take whoever to, to fill it out. But if you hit on some of these targets, uh, these top targets, especially a few that we've talked about today, you've got a better chance to stay close to where you're at. I do think 13 is probably the ceiling for Minnesota in terms of a ranking. I think uh, June and July is going to be a very big so it's already been a huge month and time for verbal commitments. So I do think that, that those numbers are going to fluctuate across the country. So everyone's going to be in that 15 to 20 range once we get to the season or maybe mid season. So I do think it'll level out a little bit for the Gophers, but you got to stay in that top 20 conversation. I think that's, that's really where it's got to be. You want to recruit at or above the on-field level, right? So if you're a program that cracks the top 25 routinely, and then apexes near that top 10, you want to recruit in that 10 to 25 range uh, to reflect that. So it's not just, oh, this is a, you know, a fluke year. It's, it's, a, it's a year that they just kind of had the stars aligning. So you don't want schools to recruit against you that way. But Minnesota has been able to stay relatively consistently, you know, right on that top 25 bubble. So you want to recruit as such and, and try to stay in that that top 20 top 25 range and I do think this class has that kind of ceiling before it's all said and done love to hear it I mean I think I can speak for Gophers fans we'll take a 25 like the 25th class I you should we'll take it I mean and hopefully we're seeing that progress I mean we're seeing more consideration early on and whatnot too which I've been trying to stress on the podcast is just like even though we might not get a ton of four-star guys, we might not get any five-star guys, like there's still progress being made, especially over these last five years. So we have to look at the positive on that side as well. But two more questions for you, and then we'll wrap this thing up. One that I do have for you is how do the recruiting rankings change significantly in the off season? And I, the reason I bring this up is because we've seen our guy, Jerome Williams, go from a three-star to a four-star, but then we've also seen the flip now of our guy, Marquise Williams, going from a four-star to a three-star. Now, I know it's picking hairs, but what, what are things that recruits are taking into consideration over the off season to make any sort of changes? Well, you know, we can't speak for every outlet. Um, right. I've, I've worked at 24-7. I was at Scout prior to that. You know, I know how these processes work. And it's about data collection and data points, sometimes, not always. So in one hand, uh, there's there's track, there's other sports going on during the offseason of football that starts to build a clearer picture relative to a recruit. So, for instance, there's this big name wide receiver that is committed now in the Big Ten that after the 2021 season, the industry, and I was in this boat, was like, really like him, really polished, but don't know how well he runs. So that was really the goal of the offseason, to try to figure out just how well this kid runs. And then he happened to tear up the seven-on-seven -seven circuit, mainly with a lot of deep catches where he's easily getting behind defensive backs. So now that data point can su supplement the film on Friday nights and say, hey, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. He can be a vertical threat and take the top off of a defense. And then you adjust the ranking as such. And it goes That's the true. other way sometimes as well, right? You have a question mark about a kid and maybe you don't get that answer when you see him in the spring, when you see him in the off season, if it's tangible, it's not always tangible, not always easy to translate 
a certain uh, activity to the football field. So sometimes it does stay undefined and that, that could create fluctuation. But another factor that never gets talked about is kind of just the numerical value of these things. Um, I know at 24 seven specifically, there's only a finite number of five stars and four stars and three stars, mm-hmm. et cetera. So naturally, if your guy stays the same and there's like no new data points, but then there's this emerging recruit who everybody wants, every college wants, and then you start to look into his tape and you and you find out why and, and you you like him a lot too. So then you, you're like, hey, well, this kid's got to move all the way up. Well, naturally, every spot up he's moving, one mm-hmm. of those guys is, is chopping down one just kind of by default. So sometimes right. that's a big part of the process as well as we get closer to the senior seasons for these prospects, we get more clarity on the entire class, not just the kids who have already committed or the kids we've known about for a long time. There's got to be room for the new prospects or the late bloomers to have that space to emerge and then the rankings adjust accordingly. So it goes both ways, uh, but usually it's about data and getting that clarity uh, that, that maybe Friday night didn't show you uh, upon that first, that first check. Awesome. No, I think that's great information, especially for so many fans that are like, wait, he was four star. Like, why are we taking his stars away? It's so bogus. Like to just to hear that insight and that information, it'll be so helpful for people to be like, oh, or to also realize it's ever changing. Like once they hit the field again this fall, things are going to flux. Things are going to ebb and flow. Guys who were bumped it down to a just barely a three star now or bordering on that edge they can make their way right back up there as soon as they touch the field again so love that insight but the final question I have for you is are you hearing any names outside of who we talked about today that might be surprising to hear or that may have more of an interest in the Gophers than any of those people that we had really talked about not any names in particular came but I'm just curious to see what we talked about earlier they're, they're a bigger class at this point, right? 18 verbal commitments, 10 states represented, by the way, which is a really big deal in, in that kind of perception of Minnesota department. But 18 spots, we've talked about four, five, six guys who look like they're about to make a decision one way or the other very soon. So get going into mid-July in the dead period, Minnesota could very well be at 20 plus verbal commitments. So where I'm curious um, with is the space. W- what is still available for Minnesota uh, in terms of the positions they're even looking at with a class that is so big at this point? Or do you start to turn the page and think about the class of 2024 once Mm -hmm. the the season actually gets here, which is not a bad plan. It's something we've seen P.J. Fleck do in the past. Uh, So I do think some of the names we'll talk about in in two, three months have a lot to do with, with what's about to happen in the next two or three weeks with some of these commitments coming off the board. Um, if Minnesota surprises and maybe pushes beyond 20 uh, in, in the next few weeks, now all of a sudden there's there's less spots for others to jump on. And we could very well see kind of a collective of turning of the page of, of uh, to the 2024 recruiting cycle. So uh, it's going to be curious to see how the next couple of weeks go. I think that will we'll have a lot to say about the fall on and off the field. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, John, for joining us. And I'm sure this will not be the last time that we have you on the podcast, but I know that you've got tons of other things to be doing before we hit this weekend. For those that are listening, we're recording this before you'll hear it. So if there's any earth shattering things, you can blame me for that one, not John. John's giving us the latest and greatest here on June 24th. So thank you again. And that's going to do it for us here at Lockdown Golden Gophers. Hope you tune in tomorrow. We're going to have all sorts of things basketball this week after you hear this podcast. So I appreciate you listening. And this is Kane Rob signing out.